my name is Padmini Nidamolu, and I'm the co-founder of Lean and Agile, an organization that was co-founded with Leila Rao for women in agile and lean spaces so we can come together and have meaningful conversations, but most importantly, what can we offer to each other? What can we seek from each other in a psychologically safe space? And this series, LEA 100, is especially started to bring stories and journeys of 100 women across the world. Uh, these are incredible women who, who have um, really stood up for themselves and have done incredible work for the organizations they work for and in communities they are um, uh, living. So these interviews are, um, they're shared on YouTube and we hope that you get something out of these interviews, especially the inspiration of if she can, I can as well. And we try to highlight not just the success part of their stories, but also the struggles they have and the challenges they had, but most importantly, how did they persist? Because that's the differentiator. That is distinct from a successful to a um, uh, not so successful uh, person. So that's what we try to bring up in these interviews. And we hope that you watch not just this, but all the interviews so you can um, get the perspective and you can take the nuggets, valuable nuggets away from these sessions. So as part of the series, today we have Suzanne Doyle from UK joining us. Hi, Suzanne, thank you for joining us. Hi, hello, nice to be here. Very nice to meet you. I'll give a very brief introduction about yourself um, to the audience and then we can get talking on a deep dive, yeah? So a few words about Suzanne. Uh, Suzanne has a deep experience and expertise gained across a broad range of clients in financial services. She led many organizations in large scale transformations across business and IT to achieve agility in the marketplace, but also a mindset change for leadership and teams on continuous improvement and successful collaboration. She was very passionate about thrilling the customer through agile and lean accelerated delivery, lean startup, optimizing product development flow and organizational design around faster delivery of value. Suzanne is a valued coach, trainer, facilitator and an advisor. Suzanne can develop both internal expertise and executive leadership required to support large scale cultural and behavioral change. She's a regular speaker at conferences and agile meetups. Welcome Suzanne again. And that was just a sneak into who you are, but let's get started. Um, Suzanne, can you share with us what brought you into the agile space? Um, yeah, I think it was sort of a build on. So I've, I, my background is in IT. Um, but also then I went in to do a lot of transformations across finance. And then I went into the business side. And um, it wasn't until I sort of went into a couple of the organizations and they were doing their own transformation. So I felt the pain of being sort of a program manager and having an agile coach going, you know, we have to go agile. So I feel like I've had the pain of knowing what I know and then had to sort of change sort of mid stance to something which was quite foreign but once you sort of let that go it was actually like not looking at um, where it was difficult but where it could actually aid so I've sort of been doing it for now sort of um, over seven years and I've sort of loved my learning path so I'm always in the agile space trying to learn more so yeah yeah that's, no, that's, that's actually fantastic and I think most of us kind of um, came into the agile space that way right we were doing program management or you know the typical you know, as DLC in a sequential way. And when we stumbled upon Agile in, in one way or the other, there is no looking back because I think once you kind of see the value and benefits of Agile, and I think, as you said, thrilling the customer with more iterative mm -hmm. development and retrospectives, there's really no looking back. So um, yeah. that, that definitely resonates with most of us. So um, can you tell us a little bit about when you first started um, your journey, in the space and when you were trying to kind of evolve as an agile coach and other hats you might have worn, what were some of the challenges 
that you encountered? And how did you solve for that? Yeah, I think it's, um, I think it's easy to build yourself up because the agile coach role is so vast and I don't think any two agile coaches are the same. So some people go in, you know, with the agile manifesto or with the scrum guide or like what I call their, you know, their theory of what it is and they sort of police it. So there's that sort of realm of people that, you know, um, do that. And then there's you've got the other spectrum of people who are very much um, professional coaches or go too far on the coaching side. And it's quite a vast thing. And then you've got the training, the mentoring um, and trying to hold all those stances. I feel like it's uh, a dance. So I feel that it's um, sort of being easy on yourself, partnering with the client, but working out when do you go into those different stances or wear those many hats? Because I feel like it is a balancing act of, you know, when you do your educational training, when do you do your mentoring, you know, when do you do your coaching, when you go back to the theory and you're sort of like going around those or maybe facilitating the team or the leadership on, on what they want to get to. So it's it's almost like you can't be 100% in all those areas. Mm. So I think it's great to just pick one area that you want to be at your learning edge um, and sort of focus one at a time. I sort of started trying to I wanted to be great at everything and then you sort of realize it's just too much so it's better to focus your attention in one area work on that and when you feel comfortable in that area work on another area so and, um and yeah go easy on yourself i think it's a lot to take on yeah yeah and, and i love what you just mentioned um uh, in fact you know when i was uh, listening to you something came to my mind um uh, I think I was, I was chatting with another uh, Leah 100 woman and she mentioned something very similar that I think we try, especially we women try to be good at everything, right? I think it's instinctive yeah. that you want to kind of take the reins and, and do everything very well. But um, mm -hmm. it's, it's often just not practical, right? Because we mm -hmm. have only so much brain space. We just have so many hours in a day. So I think what you just yeah. said is, is so valuable right? While you probably are um, good at all these categories, I think you need to have the deep expertise and, and spend your time, you know, in, in one pillar, in one stream. So you can actually start developing and, and you can start becoming an expert in that while, of course, still having and embracing the other aspects of yeah. coaching. Yeah, well, that makes a lot of yeah. sense. Yeah, and I think just to add to that, it's it's you know it's interesting because we we sort of um, teach and talk about uh, for organisations and for leaders and teams to do small experiments in a safe space, but sometimes we ourselves don't give us room to experiment. Yeah. And so I sort of sort of question myself: Am I at my learning edge or am I playing it safe? So another question that I'd like to bring to you, Suzanne, is how challenging was it to convince leadership? Um, on an agile transformation, because often that is the layer that needs to be, you know, bought in and convinced mm -hmm. so they can kind of influence and impact the organization towards transformation. Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. Um, where I start from is very much a empathy viewpoint. So I put myself in their shoes and they've got a lot of risk. And so what, if you're in their shoes, you want something to give you a balanced story where, where it can go well, where the downfall is and how, um, and partnering with them on how do they have to show up differently in the agile transformation? Cause like the leaders do have a, a critical role for their success. And it's very much like meeting them where they are. And so what I don't go in, I don't go in and sort of say, this is gonna be fantastic. It's gonna be an easy ride. You're gonna get all these benefits. So I usually go in saying, you know, it's a really, if you want to do a, a transformation in your organization, it is a difficult journey. And, you know, we all get tested at certain points. And I'm there very much as their partner in this. But I, it, what I'm trying to do is build a rapport and build open communication channels. So I think I need to know, you know, um, where their thoughts are or where their fears are or their hopes are. And when I know those, then I can sort of partner with them, um, with the leadership team for that organization. So it's very much honoring them where they are and what sort of evidence do they need to see to be able to take a step? Because it is very hard when you go, this will be great. Trust me, 
I know what I'm doing. Um, you wouldn't trust a salesperson that would come in and say that to you. So it's it's very much like um, I, I sort of do go into my coaching stance of partnering with them on the journey. Yeah. And I love what you mentioned uh, regarding empathy, right? Because they probably have their own, um, I would say, apprehensions of somebody coming yeah. in and asking them to transform the ways of working. And there's always that resistance to change. So I think building empathy and also the smaller experiments in safer space, just like you mentioned, I think yeah. makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I For one leadership team, what I did, which were in a sort of um, more traditional landscape, there was a lot of fear of change. Mm. So it was like the big elephant in the room. And what I did was sort of um, name it. So got them to think about, okay, what, what, what are all the things that could happen to make this fail? What, what would you do? And that was, that was very freeing for them because then they brought out all the stuff they were thinking and put it out in the open. Mm. And then from that list of all those things, you know, what are the things that you're currently doing today and what can we stop or take action on? And what are the things that we can do to reverse some of this? So it was a very freeing um, sort of exercise for them to get all the elephants in the room out. Because sometimes we go in thinking about all the good and we don't want to also their history of transformations or whatever change they've been currently doing in the organisation. So I think it's when I go into an organisation, I look at what are the current changes they've going, gone through? Um, how successful have any of those changes be? Because then that gives me a litmus of like, how does that organisation, how can they adopt and change? And then based on that, I sort of then look at, okay, what could the roadmap be for this particular change? Yeah, yeah. I think, um, you know, the organisations or the leadership layer, putting it all on the table and of course, bringing their own vulnerabilities and saying that we failed so many times and we have fear doing this again, as you said, I think liberates them. It's, it's all out there yeah. on the table for you to kind of look at maybe this sort of experiment didn't work. Let's pivot to something else. I think that's a, it's, I would say it's, it's a very collaborative approach and a very collaborative way to kind of, you know, get that partnership going. So, um, yeah, yeah, that's yeah, very true. You have those conversations. And mm -hmm. um, as you implement Agile Transformation, Suzanne, um, there are several times when you probably are not taken seriously, right? It happens to the best of us. It happens to the most of us, right? Um, you're not taken seriously. And it, it's probably not as much of a road, um, uh, I would say, um, uh, as much of a journey you had with the organization for them to trust you enough, to have that faith in you enough that they implement what you're asking them to do, right? Mm -hmm. How do you handle that? Because before you do certain amount of experiments, you really can get that momentum built and, and running. How do you handle those yeah. first few months or quarters, if you will? Yeah, I think it's, it's, yeah, you bring up a very good question. I think it's those first couple of months where you're trying to gauge in the organization how people are adopting it. And I, I sort of go back to um, the one I like to look at is the edge model, uh, which might be familiar with, but it's like a big triangle and you have the traditionalists, the leapers, and at the top, the bridge builders. And there's going to be just with human nature, some of those people that leave the idea and they'll go into that leaper area there's going to be some people who are going to be a little bit resistant. They're going to be more in the traditionalist area. Um, and then there's, there's bridge builders up the top. They can see value in both landscapes, what they're currently doing, but also maybe what the benefits could be um, in Agile. And so you've got this, when I think about this far set, um, there's no judgment. Anybody can be in those areas. But what I try and do is find out who are my bridge builders in the organization and I give them, you know, and if it's always volunteer, but they're like my sort of change agents. So it's not me. So if I just think of me coming into an organization and trying to change it, that's a very uphill battle. But if I think of getting those bridge builders um, to volunteer and be part of the change agent, they're the ones that can um, talk to the traditionalists and maybe get them to move up a little bit of being more comfortable with the change. So that's my sort of game plan when I usually do yeah. No, I love that, actually. Um, I think you nailed it. I think those change agents from within the organizations are our best partners, right? Yeah. Um, 
the early adopters, if you will, right? You know, who, who kind of get it, uh, you know, sooner than later or sooner than others. Uh, there, I, and I love the term you used, bridge builders. So I'm gonna steal it with your permission. I love that, right? Yeah, so yeah. You can build those bridges. Yeah. Yeah. No yeah. So um, another aspect that, um, you know, I always ask my interviewees is, um, some of the women are very apprehensive and fearful to put themselves out there, right? I think it also comes from the cultural background, cultural backdrops and societal norms that they have been in um, uh, for most part of their careers probably. And um, they're very apprehensive to even, uh, you know, put something out there in terms of uh, an advice or maybe something written, a blog post or, um, just express themselves freely. And I've seen in most cases that, you know, in the transformation journey, that is a huge impediment. That's a huge hindrance because you have to be out there and not be fearful of how it's taken, right? Because you, you, you kind of have to experiment and that's the experiment. So let's just put this in place and see how it works. And uh, I've, I've, I've seen that most women are uh, kind of fearful of that. What would your advice be for, um, you know, women coaches in particular, if you will. Yeah, yeah, no, great question. Um, so I was one of those. I think where, where I changed to sort of more step into my power was having um, some mentors around me that I could ask questions to. Um, and a big thing was, because I also became a professional coach, so I did my, mm. my CFPCC, uh, which really helped me. But that I had to be very open and vulnerable and go to group supervision sessions about what was happening at clients, what, how I was turning up and, and being as a coach. And that is sort of reflection on steroids because you can have a group of people ask you um, very direct questions mm -hmm. and you have to sort of look inside going, okay, how are reflecting, how am I coming across as a coach and who do I want to be as a coach? Um, and who is Suzanne sort of thing. So having that infrastructure is really important like you can do it with some reflection and journaling but I think you know use your community around you gather a couple of of um, females and males and and have your inner group and and talk about these things it's it's great you know everybody's got their war stories and their successes um, but it's really you know keeping a journal reflecting on what you're doing what you could have done differently so one of my practices I try and do is before um, I'm doing a workshop or I'm going to coach is just think about, okay, how am I showing up and what do I want, you know, out of this, what would good look like for me? And then when I'm in the coaching session or workshop or whatever I'm doing, how is that going for me? So using myself as instrument, what's coming up in myself, because usually there's a parallel process that could be yeah. happening. So if I'm feeling stressed or anxious, um, if I know what my biases are, what's actually happening in the leadership team here? And sometimes naming what's happening in me sort of helps them um, voice it and do that as well. So I use that a lot. And then I usually journal after what, what did I think work well, what would need to change, what could I do differently. And if you continue with that, then you're doing that, you know, inspect and adapt and you're continuously improving. Yeah, yeah. I love that personal level retrospectives and journaling. I think that gives you a good mm -hmm. runway that you're building for yourself to take off at certain point. I think uh, most of us don't do it enough, right? I think we do the retrospectives for the teams and leadership and the organizations, but we, we, we uh, hardly do it for ourselves. And uh, as you said, I think in the first few months, it's extremely important, especially in any transformation. Yeah. In general, to have that going, right? That thread running in parallel, uh, however mature you are as a coach, I think yeah. that still helps. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's yeah. a fantastic nugget. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, I have to do more yeah. myself. Okay. Yeah, cool. Um, as we wrap up, Suzanne, um, do you have any advice for our community? It could be just a one-liner. It could be just a word that you live by. Uh, any advice that you might have for us? Um, I, I just want to say that the, the Agile community is so supportive um, and welcoming. Um, and, and it's a great community to leverage. And I think if anybody's out there and they want to do a little talk at one of the conferences or meet up 
there's always a space for people to come along. And just, you know, there's a bit of balance of getting, you know, getting information from the community, but also giving back. And I think it's nice when you sort of keep those things in balance. So yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a great community to belong to. Great. So it's, it's like give and take, right? Yeah. You offer yeah. something and you seek from the community and have the trust in the community. Fantastic. Yes, On that note, thank you so much, Suzanne, for your time and for your insights. Yes.